All right, hello and welcome to this wonderful conversation on geopolitics and the just transition that is hosted by the African Center for Green Economy in partnership with wonderful people that make great conversations happen. And we want to say thank you to the IDRC, which is the International Development Research Center for coming together to allow us to have this conversation. My name is Nsiki Nkize. I am a social entrepreneur. I run a business called Mentor, where we support female social entrepreneurs. I am a speaker, MC, and for today, I will be your facilitator as we unpack this conversation and really figure out, you know, where do we stand um, in what's currently happening from a global context. I would like to invite you all to join the conversation and to follow this conversation. And if you can follow um, the African Center across social media, and the handle for that is at Afri underscore CGE, and you can find them on Instagram, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn. So whether you're participating in this conversation live or whether you um, see this conversation afterwards, we do want to keep the dialogue going. So please do um, take the time to jump onto social media, share your comments um, and your insights as well. So if you're sitting here and you're like, okay, cool, I signed up because the title sounds interesting, but I'm actually Actually not sure what's going on you know it's kind of weaving in all of these different things to say that yes we sit in Africa uh, for those of us on this call I think you represent South Africa Uganda Zambia and Cameroon you know so there's, there's quite a broad view of what's happening across the continent um, but just because we you know are down here and the world seems to forget about us and the things that happen doesn't mean that we're not affected by what's happening in the world, you know, and things that we've seen recently um, happening in the US and the judgments happening there. Um, we've recently seen the prime minister in the UK resign from his position. And of course, that war that's happening in China, I mean, in, in uh, the Ukraine. Um, and then also just looking at America experiencing the highest inflation rate in 30 years, right? All of these things at some point affect Africa. It affects our oil prices, it affects our inflation. It affects our food supply. And so really fast is to say, what is that implication on our environment, on our context, and how do we move forward from there? And just inviting to this stage, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, just to give us a little bit of context from his perspective in the work that we are doing. Sorry, guys, my dog for some reason have chosen that this is the perfect moment for him to participate in the conversation. Um, but just to start with our first speaker, I think I'd like to um, welcome to the stage Dr. Mao Amos. Um, just to see set for us, you know, why is this conversation important? And I think uh, Dr. Amos, I'll read your bio out when I welcome the entire panel and kind of go through who's who in the room together. But can I ask you just to come on and to share with us why the importance of this conversation and why the center has chosen to have this conversation? Uh, thank you, Nsiki, and thanks everyone for showing up to this webinar and to just participate in this very important um, con conversation. I think that uh, there's no better time to talk about these issues more than now, because as we all realize, Africa and the rest of the world, we are becoming increasingly connected to whatever happens across the globe. And at the African Center for Green Economy, where basically, if I some, say something briefly about us, we're a think tank based here in South Africa, but we work across across the region. And our mandate is really to push for evidence po evidence based policy making to translate ideas that are relatively abstract to into a way that can actually make a difference in our people's lives. And looking at the current trends, if you see like the kind of conversations, right, the kind of challenges that we, the world is facing now is that it has a direct implication on Africa and what is actually happening on the continent. We, the continent has just recovered from, from COVID and then we're hit with this global uh, increase in, um, in oil and, and food price. And according to the African Development Bank, uh, this year alone, more than 1.8 million uh, Africans will be pushed further back into, 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 into poverty. So we face a very significant challenge as a continent. And obviously these issues around the global dynamics have direct implications of how we as a continent respond to some of these, um, to some of these challenges. And so for us, I think that the opportunity is now to ensure that these conversations, these challenges that are very up, uh, that are out there has to be brought to the, essentially to the man on the street so that we can collectively uh, map the way forward. So for me, that is the reason why we actually convened this, um, this dialogue, because these are very pertinent issues. And I'm sure Dr. Richard later will talk about 
that this year, Africa is hosting the COP27, which is the global conference of parties around climate change. The question is, to what extent is this global dynamics going to influence the outcome of, 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 of climate change? And, and, and obviously, as Africa, we need to make sure that we get the resources so that our countries can effectively be able to respond to some of these uh, to, to some of these ch challenges. And without um, uh, without putting in the right strategies, without putting in the right mechanisms, we will not be able to respond effectively to some of these um, to, 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 to some of these these challenges. So already, we're seeing that there's a potential risk that commitments that have been made in Glasgow towards achieving the climate agenda could be diversified somewhere. We've seen in countries like Germany that had strong commitments towards uh, moving towards renewable are uh, having to take a short-term responses by addressing the energy crisis through you know, exploiting coal again. And so what does this all mean for Africa's agenda moving, move, moving forward? And for me, I think that is really the crux of the, of the issue here that we would like our stakeholders who are in this forum and elsewhere to for us to collectively work towards identifying what those solutions are and how can we make sure that the most vulnerable communities, the most vulnerable members of society can be able to build the adaptive capacity that they require so that they can respond effectively to the impact of climate change. And Dr. Amos, thank you so much for that. And I think that really, um, for me, captures why we are here and why this conversation is so important. You know, And I think it's important um, as a think tank to have these kinds of conversations so that as the world is moving, we are mindful of how we move with the world, but also how um, our contributions as Africans make a difference. Um, um, but also to kind of say, you know, within the global context, what are the innovations that we're seeing coming from our students, um, our academics, our research, institutions and how can those innovations be applied in an African-centric way that makes sense for all of us. Um, so with that I'd like to welcome our panel. Um, so starting with uh, Dr. Amos who you just heard from. Uh, so Dr. Amos is a co-founder and executive director at the African Center for Green Economy, a leading nonprofit think tank based in South Africa. The center's mission is to champion an inclusive and just transition in Africa through undertaking research and providing thought leadership. Dr. Amos has more than 15 years experience in the green economy sector in Africa and globally as a researcher and thought leader and advises on a range of issues, including climate finance, low carbon development, inclusive business models, public private partnerships, corporate sustainability strategies, water stewardship, stewardship and so forth. Uh, Dr. Amos began his career as a conservation biologist working for the WWF South Africa as a freshwater program manager, where he worked with leading companies in South Africa to help them understand their water-related business risks and develop mitigation strategies. Dr. Amos holds an MSc and PhD in conservation biology from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and he is originally from Uganda and speaks multiple languages, including Kiswahili and Arabic. And I must say Kiswahili um, after visiting Kenya is definitely one of the languages I need to need to learn. Um, our second panelist that I'd like to welcome to our virtual platform is Dr. Richard Munang. Um, Dr. Richard is currently the African Regional Climate Change Coordinator at the UN Environment Program. He's also the Acting Deputy Director for UNEP African Office, and he supervises the delivery of all the organization's programs and projects in Africa. Dr. Munang's experience encompasses a unique blend in programming and policy on regional and global issues of climate change policy, environmental management, sustainable development, clean energy, resource efficiency, and food security from the lens of accelerated economic growth. And he's involved in enhancing skills retooling of youth through a mentorship tool he, he founded called Innovative Volunteerism. Dr. Manang also holds a, P, a, a doctor, a doctor of philosophy degree in environmental change and policy from the University of Nottingham in the UK, and is a non and is an executive and has an executive certificate in climate change and energy policy from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. So, welcome, Dr. Richard. Lovely to have you with us. And our final panelist is Dr. Arthur Bain No. I hope I said that correctly. Um, he is the Executive Director of Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment. Previously, he worked as a civil society fellow at the International Peace Institute, a New York-based public policy think tank. 
Um, he also holds a PhD in peace and conflict studies as, and a master's in arts in peace studies from the University of Brantford and a bachelor of arts degree in mass communication from Makere University. He's a scholar and author of several articles on peace, security, and natural resources that have been published across the world. So welcome to you, Dr. Arthur. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, so Dr. Amos, I wanna to come to you first. You know, I think, you know, being in this space as academics, as researchers, as people who, who work towards um, a just transition, I think a lot of these terms are familiar to us, um, but I'm also mindful that this is a topic that more and more people are, are, are becoming mindful of, especially as we see um, conscious consumerism becoming a thing. So before we you know, go to the deep end of this conversation, uh, Dr. Amos, could you just take a moment to put in scope for us, what do we mean when we're talking about um, a, a just transition and geopolitics? You know, for people who kind of feel like, oh, this is why this is, should be important to me, you know, just to say the angle that they should be considering. Yeah, th thank you, Nsiki. I think that um, for me, if we look at this issue of just transition, that's why we could not disconnect it from politics and the broader issue around geographical dynamics of how these things, governance systems and so on work. Uh, but I would like to start by saying, first of all, by recognizing that our current economic model is, first of all, dysfunctional. And dysfunctional, that's why we have very high level of unemployment, very high level of inequality, we have environmental degradation and so on. So the trajectory under which the world economic model that is undertaken, that is very high dependent on growth, is not working. You know? And what that has done is that it has left a lot of people behind in poverty and so on. And so recognizing that we face systemic challenges in terms of, as in, in relation to global change, we need to transition into a world that is much more sustainable, but more importantly, a world that is much more inclusive that does not leave anyone behind. And so the concept around just transition is that how do we transition so that the people, the communities, the society that we regard now in our current economic model as losers, when we transition into more energies, uh, newer energy systems, more sustainable ways of living, that we leave no one behind and everyone wins. And so the key issues around, uh, there are basically three dimensions to, um, to the issue around justice, um, uh, just transition. It's about distribution, making sure that everything is distributed um, fairly, that procedurally um, we ensure that um, uh, everyone is bro brought along in terms of the kind of processes and so on that, um, uh, uh, that, 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 that are required to transition. And so that we can make the whole thing inclusive and everyone is left behind. And obviously, geopolitics comes in quite... Uh, quite prominently because we are countries and communities don't live in isolation. Uh, independent govern, governance systems do interact and that, those politics have direct implication on actually how these systems are getting implemented, how these strategies get implemented on the ground. And there are numerous examples. I mean, the cliche now is obviously the war on Russia and Ukraine, but in, on, on the African countries, we have seen the dynamics around poor trade between countries, issues around lack of effective cooperation, around transboundary management of resources, and so on. But the point is that geopolitics is basically around how governance systems related to geographical location intersect and what those implications are on how uh, some of these environmental policies and strategies get implemented on the ground. In, in a nutshell, that's the lame way of, of saying, you know, Geopolitics and, uh, and environmental uh, management are really interesting. This question, I'd like to go over to uh, Dr. Bainu Mudisha. Um, just to say, you know, what role does politics play um, in driving the just transition and what are some of the implications of that? And I ask that because I know a lot of people, especially, you know, the, the millennials and the younger people kind of go, oh, politics, that thing over there, um, and not really caring about it as much, not realizing the impact and the implications of it, um, and also how that kind of comes back around and affects them as well. So could you please speak to that a little bit to And just to unmute yourself as well, um, Dr. Arthur. Yes, uh, you can hear me now. 
Yes, uh, uh, politics uh, plays a very big role uh, 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 in the in the actually uh, determining where we find ourselves. Uh, and you see here we are talking about global politics, talk about regional politics and the national politics, for example, for my country. Uh, in this country, uh, uh, as you uh, rightly said, we are a public policy research think tank and a code uh, has one of the most developed uh, program on environment and natural resource uh, governance, environment and natural resource governance. We came to the conclusion that there was a need uh, to, 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 to democratize access management and utilization of natural resources, uh, uh, looking at the, at the fact that actually most governments or political leads uh, in Africa and Uganda in particular capture natural resources, dominate natural resources, utilize uh, 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 the, 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 the proceeds from natural resources to control political power. And so our theory of change was if you democratize access management and utilization of the proceeds of natural resources or could get transparency and accountability in the management of natural resources, you would ultimately uh, 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 democratize uh, uh, the political space. Now, so uh, politics uh, to a large extent, uh, you will find that where countries are lagging behind in terms of democratic, uh, 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 democratic achievements, if I have a lot of democratic deficit, most of those countries have their resources poorly managed, degraded. You have, uh, uh, you have poor uh, populations. Uh, we can talk about the paradox of, of poverty in the midst of plenty. And so uh, uh, my view is that actually, if we, if we democratize, uh, if we advance democracy, you also advance uh, 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 proper management, utilization of resources, and, and you actually see uh, economic transformation. So that for us, really, that's the theory of change. So, so we still have a big challenge uh, in this country. Our natural resources are always attacked towards the elections. We have, yes, it's a factor of democracy. We are saying we are democr democratic, but our natural resources have been destroyed even when we, see, we think we are, we, are, we are democratizing. It is during elections time that the, 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 the communities who have been exploited, who are poor, attack natural resources like wetlands, forests, and destroy them. And then the politicians, including the president, will say, don't, 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 touch, my, don't touch my voters. So people take advantage because they, ultimately he, she wants to be elected. And there are four wetlands are destroyed, forests are destroyed, everything is destroyed. And then afterwards, then they can. Uh, so you can see that is really not, not, not democracy. But anyway, that notwithstanding, what Accord has been doing, we work, we are, we are, we are part of the global, uh, the global economic coalition, Jake. Uh, uh, we, are the, we are the national hub for Uganda and we are in a regional hub for East Africa. Recently, we launched the East African hub and this. And essentially, we are uh, supporting our country and the countries in the region to transition uh, to a green economy, which a green economy, as actually uh, Dr. Mao has talked about, it is uh, inclusive in terms of benefit, in terms of growth. It is sustainable. It recognizes the limits of nature. And so uh, that's the idea that we are, all, uh, we, are, we are talking about. But also, you realize, as he said, politics even in countries that were very green, like Germany, I visited Germany and I, I, I was taken through, I could see the advances in terms of the transition to green economy. I didn't know that because of the war in Ukraine and, the, and the Russia uh, switching off the gas that they have actually resorted to, to coal. The US also has resorted to coal. The Supreme Court has, has, has actually ruled that they can use those uh, and clean uh, energies. So, so, uh, so that is, of course, politics. Uh, uh, but we shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't lose hope in the sense that I have seen progress here, especially if you support the policy, legal regime, the, the institutional framework, but you also create networks of the willing. In this country, as part of the transition, we have a green economy network of civil society, and it's a, a broad-based network of civil society, private sector, government, including actually our military, uh, working together in different uh, uh, aspects to transition this country. If we create that critical mass and we deal with the legislation, the policy framework, 
institutional framework, I think the transition is possible. I think Ma, Dr. Mao, you saw the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance here is very green now. They are very receptive. Where the, the, the budget is supposed to be uh, greened as well. And so if that commitment is translated into practical steps, uh, the, the transition to green economy, I think, is possible. But it is also being cut, cut, uh, catalyzed by the, real, the reality. Right now in Uganda, we have a prolonged drought and famine. And famine and the demonstrations have been, uh, actually government has been cracking down on demonstrations. People crying out, they have no food. People are poor. And so the impact of climate change, which has been uh, uh, complicated by, of course, COVID and the impact of COVID-19 and the disruption, the supply chain is actually mobilizing all of us, including people in government, to quickly take off and transition to a green economy. Thank you. And I think when I'm listening to you, the key thing for me that stands out is ownership, right? That we don't and can't have um, just, just transition or democratize um, government without the ownership of the people in the country and the ownership from the people who are affected um, by the ecosystem. So when you mentioned the Green Economy Network, I, I was smiling my heart because I think that's exactly uh, what we need, you know? And then um, I think even from a geopolitics perspective, you know, there's um, thinking around, you know, certain countries where China has come in and is finding a lot of things. And I think with the distraction for, of some of the Western countries that typically finance some of the DFIs, um, it's interesting to then see, you know, what are some of the gaps that are opening up and are there um, new people that are going to come in to finance green energy or, you know, does Africa take take a different path? And I saw a question and it was put in by Bojimelo asking around, and I think we'll address this later on, um, but, you know, inquiring around just transition to defined in the context of Africa versus different countries. I um, mean, what does a just transition look like in different contexts? Um, and with that, I'd like to go over to Dr. Richard and really just find out from you, um, from a geopolitics perspective, you know, how do you think that will affect um, a just transition, I suppose globally, and then again, specifically from an African context? Thank you very much, um, uh, Siki, and also to uh, Dr. Uh, Amis and Dr. Otto. I mean, they've already laid the ground. The reality is that Africa is not an isolated continent, and Africa is not a country, and Africa is not adverse uh, to the global challenges. Africa is part of the global community, and the countries are part of the global community. And so when the world sneezes, Africa will feel the pitch. The, the, the big question should really be um, where Africa is today has before the crisis, whether we're talking crisis of droughts that are costing over 600 million livestock in the eastern part of Africa, or we're talking crisis of cyclones that we saw uh, in 2019, and we still see Cyclone Naidai, Cyclone Kenneth, and we're talking about now drought again in East Africa. Then we talk COVID-19, which has already been alluded to. So Africa has been suffering from a barrage of different emergencies and calamities. And now then we're talking about the crisis, food crisis, energy crisis, and financial crisis. And the position of Africa today, it's a continent that is already suffering the climate crisis. Uh, it's not that Africa is going to solve the climate crisis in five years. No, Africa is actually suffering the impacts of climate change today. We see children dying. We see these droughts which are offshore of the changing climate. So the bigger question is, if you look at the discourse on just transition, across the entire world, Africa's position and Africa's understanding of this needs to be juxtaposed within the contextual realities of the continent. 257 million brothers and sisters across the continent going to bed hungry. 620 million African citizens energy impoverished. And then on top of this, over 900 million, depending on clean cooking. So the just transition cannot be pitched from an energy transition as it's currently been seen across the entire world because the emissions across the world, over 73% of them, are as a result of um, energy usage. But at the same time, when you look at Africa, Africa only contributes up to about 4% of the global emission. It means Africa is actually a net positive, um, uh, uh, a net sink when it comes to emissions. And therefore, the discussion on just transition needs to center around one world in the African continent, which is socioeconomics. Why is Africa vulnerable to climate change? Because it has a very low socioeconomic base. People are unable to have the resources they're supposed to have. And resources here are not just in terms of money. 
Uh, people are unable to put food on the table. People are able, unable even to find jobs. The young people are actually getting 12 million into the labor market without this. And so when you put this within the context of socioeconomics, it therefore means that a just transition in Africa, as already said by Dr. Amis and Dr. Otto, it's about equity. It's about putting food on the table. It's about more money in more pockets. And unless we look at it from this perspective, then we'll be missing the bigger picture. And therefore, it boils down to the aspect of a narrative here. Narrative, there is profound power in a narrative. The just transition narrative in the African continent, right, it needs to center around Africa's indigenous contextual understanding, which is 80% of the continent is actually in the informal sector. They are at the bottom of the pyramid. How do we lift them up? By ensuring that we utilize clean energy to add value to what they produce, by ensuring that we leverage nature-based approaches to grow food, but not only grow food, but grow food to add value because we're currently losing food worth 48 billion US dollars. And this contextual reality then shifts the discussion now to how can we leverage Africa's abundance? Mm -hmm. to caution Africa against the shocks because these emergencies and calamities will continue, whether it is the war in Ukraine and Russia, or it is drought that we're seeing, or it is floods and cyclones, or it is COVID-19. We will not stop emergencies and we will continuously have these emergencies happening. But a big question that we need now is how do we then climate proof Africa so that it can be socioeconomically viable and at the same time lift people from the bottom of the pyramid? And um, generally, I think when you look at Africa, the, the approach from, from a business perspective should be thinking about social entrepreneurship, social innovation, and social impact. And those should be key measures uh, for any organization. Um, I just want to say to everybody who is in, in, in this call with us, um, I see people introducing themselves in the chat section. So please do go ahead, um, let us know who you are, where, which country you're joining us from, which organization you're joining us from. And then if you do have any questions, please don't put your questions in the chat box please put them in the Q&A section. So you will see there's a two speech bubbles there with the Q&A, click on that and put your question in there um, and I'll be able to track those and address them um, as part of our conversation. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Amos, you know, really picking up from what Dr. Richard just said is I'm curious about, you know, if we're going to um, build in those mechanisms to make sure that we have that change happening and that that change is um, applicable across the continent, utilizing um, natural resources, and local resources and you know being contextually applicable what are some of the things that governments need to be looking at um, that inform policy you know and what are some of the things that we as advocates um, we as people who lobby we as people who do research what are some of the things we should be looking into and bringing to the fore um, that should be considered as part of how we develop the policies that make sure that we're protecting the continent um, and climate proofing ourselves you know, thanks, Nsiki. You know, just talking off my head, there's a, a couple of things that we can do. First of all, I think it's a recognition that um, there are no quick wins to some of these issues. Um, it's so easy for governments across the continent to jump into, you know, sexy projects that are multi-year mega projects that at the end of the day don't actually benefit the people. So it's important to know that the transition is a journey, understanding the social economics, creating the system that would actually make a difference in people's life is a journey that does not happen overnight. And more importantly, it has to be driven using an evidence base, has to be in an inclusive manner and process. You know, um, there's so much potential and a lot of the solutions actually that are required to address some of these issues lie at the local level. But like Richard has said that, Oftentimes, the models that we take, we translate Western concepts and next day we want to make them happen without really internalizing them into our own context and seeing actually how do we create those win-win situations. You know, in South Africa, we work in the, in the Northern Cape uh, province and um, this is the Northern Cape province, for those who don't know, is the, economic, is the hub for renewable energy in South Africa. But most of those communities don't actually have access to to, 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 to electricity. And if they have access to electricity, they can't afford, you know, the, the, uh, electricity. So, so we really have to make sure that uh, this process are very inclusive. We we'll make sure that we have to bring people along so that it's very participatory and more importantly, embedded in the local realities. And 
speaks to issues like, for example, how do you empower local entrepreneurs? How do you ensure that there's technology localization? Because there's no point of transferring technology from elsewhere and completely lock out local, local value chains. And at, at the end of the day, you might be able to transition into the kind of energy you need, but you actually leave people more impoverished than they were. And that's, that's very true. And, and that is a, a key consideration. Uh, things that I find interesting, you know, working with entrepreneurs is uh, well-meaning foundations and people who have interventions coming outside of Africa, bringing them in and going, hey, you should try use this, um, you know, go make the situation better and without really finding out what people on the ground need, you know. So uh, I remember reading a case about trying to reduce malaria and they've given people nets, you know, mosquito nets to cover themselves when they see them without considering the fact that, uh, food security is a challenge in that area. So instead of using the nets to um, cover themselves for, against mosquitoes, the people ended up using the nets to go fishing um, because they needed to catch, catch food. And, you know, it's true that we need to think about solutions holistically and really understand um, the gravity of where people are and the solutions that we're asking them to take on um, because that could hinder people's desire to want to participate or to work against, you know. And um, if we're able to say, this is what people need, these are the basic needs that people need to have addressed. How do we combine this as we move forward? And um, that allows more, more buy-in. Uh, Dr. Arthur, coming back to you, you know, um, how best can African governments' functioning be supported um, in order for us to move forward with the, the just transition? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, 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 Nsiki. Uh, is, that, is that zero or, or Kosa? It's really, yes. It's yeah, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> South Africa for one month uh, when Nelson Mandela took over power, I was in Eastern Cape. I consider uh, South Africa my country uh, was associated with the struggle. So uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Dr. Mao has alluded to the, the whole point of bread and butter. Uh, in the just transition, of course, we must answer uh, people's need, the just transition, as we say, it should be inclusive, but it should also produce uh, 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 pro uh, sustainable livelihoods, smart jobs, you know, it must be attractive uh, and that kind of thing. What we've been doing here in, in the case of Uganda, uh, uh, we've been trying to, to influence uh, government uh, uh, because, you know, with COVID, most of the companies collapsed. Oh, many people lost jobs, about 70, almost actually 50% uh, of, of, of jobs were lost. And the government has put up some funds to, to recover some of these uh, small and medium enterprises uh, so that they, they, they can again, uh, you know, as you know, that actually most uh, uh, small and medium enterprises uh, produce or, or constitute about 70% of jobs across most economies. And so by allowing them to die, you really, but what, uh, what we have been trying to do is that we are insisting that these, uh, the, the funds, for example, the, there was a COVID recovery fund. Uh, we are insisting that this COVID recovery fund should be green. The money was, was put uh, uh, to the Uganda Development Bank and to be accessed by green enterprise, by, by, by medium and small enterprises generally. And now our interest is that actually the, 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 the preference should be uh, those green enterprises that are going to create uh, uh, smart or green jobs. And uh, uh, so that, that, that is working. Uh, Bank of Uganda in, in the central bank uh, here has also put up some money, uh, uh, which they have sent to the commercial banks to be accessed by very small enterprises. But then we also discover that those, uh, uh, they are not being accessed by women's groups, uh, women's businesses, youth businesses, uh, uh, but now even we insist that they should be green, target majority of the people like women's groups that are involved in green enterprises so that you can spread the net. So uh, in other words, what we are trying to do is then now to influence government, that most of these government interventions uh, uh, they, sh they should be targeting small and medium enterprises that are green. Uh, because one of the challenges that these green enterprises are facing is financing. Uh, most of them are not bankable. 
and therefore they may need a lot of uh, capacity building, but also to revolutionize, to sensitize the banks, to be able to, to do affirmative action and reach out to them, build them. In the process, they're also building the clientele uh, for them. So actually, now most of our uh, interventions, we're also uh, uh, we are working with the banks or financial institutions so that they are green and they deliver it through to reach out uh, to, 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 to the green enterprises uh, to make sure that they, are, that they are supported because they have that, that problem, but they have also never managed big money. They need to be, they need financial literacy so that they can also uh, uh, become bigger and bigger. And the final point now we are working with the Ministry of Finance to, uh, to make sure that the, the budget, from the budget inception to the end is green. Uh, 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 how do you green the budget? We've even introduced the, the capital, is this called the natural capital accounting? Uh, uh, natural capital accounting, valuation for nature. Uh, because uh, 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 so that it can even, the value of nature, when we say wetlands, swamps, and blah, blah, blah should, their value should be captured in our GDP. And you know, uh, 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 to interest the, 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 the key policymakers, especially in our ministries of finance, about the value of nature. They never considered nature. And you see, even in the financing, if you look at the amount of money that the government has been giving to the Minister of Water and the Environment, a parity. And yet, this is where a majority of our population, especially in agriculture, are employed. So, so we make uh, uh, making a lot of attempts first to conscientize the the key stake uh, stake key, key policymakers uh, uh, so that now they, so that actually they are conscientized and appreciate uh, the need for this just transition and then uh, then from there then we move. But it it is going to be easy when it comes to to, to the communities down because communities have lived there they have for the. And you talked about uh, they have in, the in their values and the traditions, they sustain nature. It is when their lives, uh, livelihoods that are threatened that then they, they pursue the survival for the fittest, like destruction of river systems that we are seeing now. They know the really importance of rivers, but now they are undermining. They are making bricks in the, in the river banks and killing those banks as a way of survival. But, uh, I think the problem has been largely uh, at the top level. Once there's appreciation there, it is easy uh, to, to, to deal with the communities. I don't know if I made some sense. Coming out strongly there again is um, this idea of localization um, and really looking to the people to be the solution um, and for the people who already have the solutions, just going, how do we support them to implement the innovations that they, they already have and how do we support them to scale up? Um, and, and I think when you're talking about conscientizing people, looking at the chat, I think everyone who's part of this conversation is conscious and aware and everyone has introduced themselves. Um, and I think most people here are from some kind of green company or organization, whether they are a um, practitioner, researcher, or an entrepreneur, it's great to see. I'm um, also quite a diverse representation. I see people here from um, Cape Verde, South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Nigeria. Um, who have I missed out? Uganda as well, I think I've mentioned. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to everybody who um, has joined us. Um, and just you know, coming back to you, uh, Dr. Amos, um, understanding how we actually scale up on just transition, you know, and I think that's that's a term that I don't, don't often know if I'm in favor or against it, you know, because I do think every localized context is unique. So while you might not be able to scale the solution, um, you may be able to, to scale the idea and, you know, copy and paste it in a different context and adapt it to work in that new context. Um, but ultimately, you do require that partnership with people on the ground to um, guide what that intervention should look like, you know. So from your side, any ideas on... How do we scale to make sure that um, you know the, the just transition happens across the continent and nobody is left behind? Uh, thank you, Msiki. You know, for us, when we think about scaling up, we think about it in two dimensions. You know, the horizontal scaling up and vertical scaling up. You know, when you think about vertical scaling up, is a traditional business where you want to you know start a you know a unicorn, a massive you know enterprise and so on, but. But horizontal scale up is basically saying that sometimes some of the solutions that are required do not necessarily have to be 
if you're running a business, they don't have to turn into a massive enterprise. But those solutions can find traction in different communities and so on that can be easily replica- replicated at scale across across landscapes, across regions, across communities, and so on. And, and to be able to achieve that, we require a culture of learning, a culture of ex- experimenting with some of these solutions. And, and what that requires is actually, you know, they say, you know, learn by doing. And, and, and more importantly, recognizing the value of failure. You know, you are a social entrepreneur, you know, that the best lessons that you learn are actually from failing. Um, and and the, the, what we're seeing in Uganda and, and many other regions, particularly around um, renewable energy enterprises, how they're actually um, uh, impacting lives of vulnerable communities, that oftentimes the best enterprises are those who are just focused on delivering access from village to village. And, and they are oftentimes not attractive to investors. But if you track their impact over long term, they are much more uh, impactful than the big, large scale um, uh, enterprises. So for me, I would say scaling up really requires, first of all, us to appreciate the importance of localizing these interventions, appreciate the value of failing and learning from, 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 from failure, and generally being experimental in how we do things. And I'm sure I can't, I, Richard can't wait to, um, to, to talk because of his innovative volunteerism because he's, he's <laughs> like deep, deep, deep in that. <laughs> no, thank you very much for that, Dr. Amos. And I do want to come back to you, Richard, um, you know, just moving a little bit away from um, only talking about the just transition and understanding more, you know, the impact of the current oil crisis, you know. Um, with the current oil, global oil crisis, what does that mean for the climate change agenda? is this. Currently, as we speak today, the crisis with oil increases have been pitched and is currently being discussed that that is an opportunity for Africa. Well, it's a blessing and it's a curse. If you look at the start of the um, crisis, especially increases in oil prices, Africa have exporters and importers. But when you look at the importers, these have actually costed the African continent up to 19 billion US dollars, resulting in inflation as we speak today, 12.2%. But there are exporters. They have not benefited. Why? Because they do not have the refinery systems within the continent to be able to add value to oil. So they export raw material, exporting employment and importing unemployment. Now let's come to food. The food in the continent today, Africa have 65% of uncultivated rebel land. But what is happening? It's importing food above 35 billion US dollars, importing unemployment and exporting employment. It then means that Africa is not prepared. And I'm trying to bring this before I answer your question, because if we do not have the fundamentals of what makes economic transformation under emergencies right, no matter what we do, we might not be able to survive the changing climate. Why do I say so? A continent today, food crisis resulting in high inflation, because of importation, yet there is no discussion on how do we leverage clean energy abundance, which Africa have 65% of the best solar resource in the entire world, but it's only having 1% of solar penetration across the entire African continent. There is something fundamentally wrong. And when we're talking about energy here, it's not just about lighting. We need to move from energy as providing light to homes in the continent to energy as a competitive resource to add value to agricultural produce so that at least we can start to add value, package, and sell across the entire African continent. But as we speak today, that is not the case. So when you look at the geopolitics of what is happening vis-a-vis the changing climate, before the increase in oil prices, before the increase in food prices, the African continent citizenry was already vulnerable to the changing climate. And as I said earlier, why? Because they have a very low socioeconomic base. They cannot put food on the table. They cannot put more money in more pockets. And if I give a very practical example, cyclones are hitting the Western world every day. In the United States, when cyclones and and hurricanes hit, what happens? Very few people lose their life. Though a life lost anywhere across the world is far too many. But when it hits in Africa, what happens? 
People lose their lives and property destroyed because the people cannot even afford insurance. How do you get insurance when you cannot be able to put more money in your pockets to then be able to afford to buy that insurance? It therefore means everything we say must center around socioeconomics. People need more food on the table and more money in more pockets. And now that takes me to the, a very important point on climate preneurship. Climate preneurship now with the geopolitics is how do we ensure that our young people who are getting to the labor market, 12 million of them, competing with fewer jobs, start to create jobs within the challenges that we face today? Because a challenge or a crisis should not be wasted. And we keep wasting wasted COVID crisis. Now we're wasting this crisis. Across the continent, 84% of the entire population is in rural areas and their energy in poverty. They don't have access to energy. Grid electricity is not going to reach them. If you, if you are told that grid electricity is going to reach them, that's a lie. We need off-grid and mini-grid to be able to reach them. Who are those who are supposed to be intervening in this? Young people. We have a continent today where nine, over 900 million of the entire population is depending on clean cooking. They depend on charcoal. But simple turning agricultural waste into fuel briquettes replaces charcoal and can tap into a 20 billion market that is currently not even tapped as we speak today. That is where entrepreneurship, climate preneurship opportunities can be created. But this is what needs to be done. We need governments at the moment to be able to put policy incentives, especially physical incentives like, like tax breaks and tax incentives. We are seeing this happening across most countries where value added tax, especially in Kenya in their finance bill of 2001, remove value added tax on um, fuel briquettes, on burgers. And this is an opportunity for you to start developing their enterprises. This should become the norm and not the exception. We are talking about today about uh, energy and there is the narrative. And I'll go back to what I said. There is a narrative that, okay, Africa have oil, Africa have gas, it should be exploited. The question is, we're not even talking about how much it costs it takes to build one uh, liquid uh, natural gas uh, terminal, 25 billion US dollars. But the International Energy Agency showed that that 25 billion US dollar invested over 10 years can help the continent for everybody to have access to clean electricity. But then the discussion is, yes, let's tap gas, let's just transition by tapping gas. We're not talking about the finance. And as we're speaking today, African countries, over 77% of them are actually having their debt to GDP at both 77. It means most of them are in economic distress. How do you then engage yourself in debt when there are low hanging fruits of turning waste to buy gas that can help mothers in communities have clean cooking gas and in the course of doing that, youth stool a retool, or turn agricultural waste into fuel briquettes that can help them replace charcoal. And you are not only going to reduce indoor pollution, but you will create opportunities. So within the climate space, it's about socioeconomic. It's about doing that, which then works with nature, not against nature, but at the same time, help young people to put more money in their pockets. And that is the kind of narrative yeah. we need now. And that's what we are doing, uh, leveraging on this period of innovative volunteerism, as Moa said. Thank you. No, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities there that you you have spoken to, um, and a lot of opportunities also presented by the different crises that exist. You know that yes, there's a challenge, but business exists in the face of being able to uh, resolve those challenges. Uh, Dr. Richard, you spoke about shocks that um, are presented, you know, and and the fact that you know we we really aren't well equipped to deal with those shocks. So I'm curious to find out from you, um, how do African countries begin to build resilient economies, um, resilient societies, and what are some of the mechanisms we should consider in, in building up that resilience? There are four things that need to be considered. The first is we must be able to leverage our climate army, which are our youth, to be the solution providers to the challenges we're facing by turning climate challenge into climate opportunity. Very simple. What do we need to do? We need to ensure that we start to retool to put centers in place. Of course, the Africa uh, uh, um, Green Economy Center, Center for Green Economy, is already doing excellent work. Can we be able to build on these institutions across the continent to build on what they're doing without reinventing the wheel? Can we be able to build on young people whom we are seeing across the continent already turning agricultural waste into fuel briquettes, into burgers, into turning solar dryers that are helping decentralize to communities so that models? We need to build their skills and capacitate them so that they become the climate army actors that can turn climate challenges into opportunity. That is one, two. Africa is a leader when it comes to climate change. And the leadership is at policy level. If you look across the entire world, Africa is the only continent in the world that have ratified the Paris Agreement more than any other. 53 countries out of 54 ratified. But unfortunately, policy implementation is the biggest problem. 
out of the 53, moon only about 20% of those have turned their nationally determined contribution into investment plans. It means that we are talking almost about 80% that I'm not doing that. How will investors come into invest in those areas? It means we'll still talk about these issues 10 years from now. But what needs to be done at the moment is goes back to what I said. Policy and physical incentive, it is not government that implement. It's ordinary citizens, especially the young people, but they need an the enabling environment. And one of the enabling environments you put policy incentive, but we need to start considering structures that we're not talking about, communal cooperatives. Communal cooperatives are structures that are found in every community. So that resources are actually channeled through them so that the informal sector and those who do not have access to formal banks to be able to assess credit can start assessing credit. And what government needs to do is to leverage what is called a de-risking scheme. That is, if government have 50 billion US dollars or 20 billion US dollars, they should then be able to map out microfinancing institution and actually give them this money so that at least they can be able to loan at very low interest rate to those who are carrying out climate action initiatives across the country so that at least they can build a resilience. The last part, which to me is the most important part, I, is what I started with. The, the narrative of liability that has somehow been perfected across the continent need to stop. Climate change is an investment opportunity. It is not a liability as it's currently been projected. And we need to start communicating the opportunity that climate change presents. And we need to start to inspire our young people so that at least they can start to create and diversify to create climate uh, um, and, and, and enterprises so that at least they can diversify the income even if they have alternative job. That then means we must ensure that climate entrepreneurship become part and parcel of educational curriculum in every school across the entire continent. Because when this is put within the vision of national development, each and everyone will start to know, yes, this is what I can do and I can make more money. And collectively, we will triple charge and bring impact to scale in a very short time. Gabby saying that just transition based on unlocking inclusive socioeconomics provides an opportunity for Africa to buffer against geopolitical emergencies. And I think just to your point around um, educating the youth that if we have more young people who do become part of that climate um, army, but also become those climate preneurs, um, that we can really take advantage of the opportunities that exist. Um, and I think in addition to that is also looking at the investment instruments and financing instruments that do exist and that are made available, you know, making sure that as young people wanting to access the space, um, that the support, the necessary support is there and it, it does exist um, from various institutions, not just um, from government. And, and I say that being um, a young person who at the moment is farming garlic, um, and you know, that's a bootstrapping operation and to scale that uh, for what I'm looking at next year, there's just no way I can afford it by myself. Um, and, on, and on the other hand, you know, bringing in um, solar power substitutes um, as another business thing that we're exploring really does require financial backing. And I think a lot of young people might find that difficult. So I think a key thing in this conversation as well is that if we're um, putting in those, those buffers and those various mechanisms and encouraging young people to participate and that the structures that exist should also um, support that transition as well. Um, I want to shift over to a few questions that have been put here. And I, what I'll do is I'll ask each of the questions so, uh, and split them up amongst each of our panelists. Um, and then I'll allow each panelist to, to respond. Um, so uh, Dr. Amos, to you, there's a question that came, well, a comment rather that came through earlier on from Boitumelo um, speaking about the definition of just, just transition um, and saying that we should, should surely we should, should we not be looking at this from a European versus African versus China versus whichever country context, um, because that, that definition would should be different, assuming um, in each space. And I suppose what is permissible and what is not in that space. So I'd link her, her statement to Janet's question for you, Dr. Amos. I um, mean, Janet was asking um, that she agrees with a lot that has been said. However, um, we haven't discussed African should African countries export their fossil fuels, for example, offshore oil and gas. Um, as this is a controversial issue. So, you know, those two things, Dr. Amos, I'd like you to speak to those. Um, there's a question here that came through from Riz. Can you hi, Riz? Um, and I think I'll pose this to uh, Dr. Richard. It's also a statement, but I think maybe Dr. Richard, you could speak to, um, is there a power vacuum that exists and who comes in to, to, to fill that power vacuum? Um, so Riz says, at the heart of a just transition, is the imperative of social dialogue, platforms of dialogue and sectors of society are either polarized or influenced by political ideologies and agendas. Therefore, the 
the suit for a just transition can be derailed or delayed based on political interests of the time. Political forces thrive or fail on the basis of social demands. You know, so maybe uh, Richard, if you can maybe just speak to that a little bit to say, you know, how how do we navigate that, especially as so many African countries do have a very um, tense political um, landscape. And then finally to you, Dr. Asa, there's a question that came through from Anonymous who says, um, as we talk of African just transition and the context of, well, they, they are in the context of Uganda, we have been seeing an influx of asylum seekers, especially in, the, in Northern Uganda, where the region now hosts, has a host of over 64,000 refugees. So what strategies can be put on the ground to achieve our targets of green economy with such high influx? Um, so I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Amos, and then we'll go to Dr. Richard, and then we'll end with Dr. Asa. Um, and I'll, I'll invite anybody else who does have any questions to please just pop them in the chat box. We do have about 30 minutes left, so I will ask our panelists to be concise, uh, so that if there are any more questions, we're able to get them in. Um, over to you, Dr. Um, Amos. Uh, thanks, Siki. And first of all, I have to apologize because I, I, was, I went offline for a bit, thanks to our energy challenges in, in, in South Africa. Look, I wouldn't agree more with what Boitimo uh, articulated in terms of making sure that um, the just transition is context specific. And I can't emphasize that enough. But you know, we cannot use textbook definitions to chart the way of Africa's future. It's very important that these kind of issues, processes are internalized, are contextually relevant so that they can make a difference in people's lives. And like Richard alluded to earlier on, we need to recognize our existing indigenous knowledge systems, expertise, and so oftentimes we think that the solution to some of these problems lie elsewhere. Yet if you look at our communities, if you visit our villages and so on, people have developed very strong adaptive capacity techniques and so on over time. What is often lacking is that disconnect between policy makers, the decisions they are making, and actually integrating these um, systems and so on much more effectively, these practices that have been tested over time that we know work, but are never really finding themselves into the policy space. And for me, I think one of the reasons why we have this disconnect, and that's how for over a long time we have tried to position the center is that there's a lack of intermediary institutions that can help to bridge between these two levels. You know, actors that actually know what is happening on the ground are very convinced about this realities on the ground, but they're also confident enough to engage at the policy space. Essentially, a, a, a hand-holding role where we gather these lessons on the ground and translate them into, into, in, into, into the policy space. And sometimes that's why we think of ourselves as a do that, you know? On the one hand, we're working directly with the entrepreneurs, telling them how to run a business, but at the same time, we can engage in dialogue with the, at the highest level. And, and I think that that for me is very important. But there's one thing I also want to highlight. Oftentimes, a lot of the, there's a false um, dichotomy that you know, a lot of these issues are Western that are imposed on the rest of the continent. Some of us who have been advocating these issues. We are born on the continent, we studied on the continent, we have never left this continent. So the idea that we are championing ideas that are from the West, the continent, is not, it's not necessarily true. It's just that we need to have more voices that really are legitimately speak about the needs of our people to be at the forefront of championing some of these issues. So we need more people on the table. The issue around whether Africa should exploit um, its natural resources. Just two days ago, I, I did a, an interview with a, um, a media outlet in Uganda because for those who don't know, Uganda just discovered oil and was about to construct one of the longest pipelines from East Africa, from Uganda into, in, into, into Dar es Salaam to export its oil. And there's a whole campaign against it. And for me, I always use the analogy of will it really exploit these resources? Will it really impact the lives of the people on the ground? And my gut feeling is that it's, it's not going to really make a material difference in people's lives. Because if you look at all countries that have exploited oil and gas, especially in developing countries, they have never really made a difference in the lives of the people. Nigeria is a classic example. And that's because we have all these other secondary systems that were required in place effectively with governance systems, you know, 
uh, these issues around corruption and so on, that even though we leave out the issue around climate out and say, can we actually exploit these resources to make a difference in people's life? My answer would be no. And very final example, a few years ago, myself and Arthur actually were in Trinidad and Tobago. And Trinidad and Tobago, basically, its entire economy is around oil and gas. And then a few years later, they had overexploited those resources that are closer to shore. And so the available resources were way offshore. And US, which was their biggest customer, had discovered its own oil and gas resources. And so Trinidad was stuck in a space where, first of all, they had never exploited other sectors of the economy. The resources that they have were already way off the, off the shore. And their biggest customer, which is the US, had discovered its own resources. At the end of the day, they, their economy suffer. So I, I, I think, and there's a whole discussion around stranded assets and how investors are not going to you know, invest in these uh, fossil resources and so on. I, my, my personal take is that we can't exploit these resources because they're not going to make a difference in our people's lives. Thanks, uh, Dr. Amos. I'm over to you, Dr. Thank you very much. And um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Emish has uh, put it uh, very rightly and very nicely. Uh, I, you, you know, sometimes, uh, let me be a little bit uh, frank and um, very, very, a little brutal here. Uh, there is always this question, who is going to do it for us? Uh, who is going to, we are going to do it for ourselves. The, the attitude that people have to do things for the continent has been a false narrative and has actually led the continent down a path that we are still struggling to find a narrative that suits context. And I think this is very, very dangerous. And we, when we have an opportunity anywhere to speak about this, we should speak about it without any fear of contradiction. I started off by saying there is profound power in a narrative. And when people are asking who is going to position the continent so that at least we can have a narrative that fits, it is us, especially the young people. The young people, I, I, I have argued this. Of course, I'm a fan of the young people. I, I believe that there can be no transformational development especially transformational climate action solutions across the continent without the young people taking charge. And that is why we, we, we focus on them. But this is the point I want to bring. We are now in a crisis. Before this crisis, there was a COVID crisis. And the question has always been, we don't have money. You will never have money enough to do what is needed. Take that to the bank. Number two is, you will never be able to do something thinking that you will be applauded for elsewhere. You have to do what is needed within your community and within your country to solve a problem that faces our mothers, our brothers and sisters each and every day. Indoor pollution kills over 700,000 Africans. These are not mere statistics. We have 257 million Africans who go to bed hungry with a stomach aching of hunger. These are brothers and sisters. These are realities that are supposed to make us emotional, not emotional to cry, but emotional to take action. And now back to the point. The reality is this. When you look across the entire African continent today, and I said this, but I will repeat it because it's important. The food prices that have resulted to inflation, we are discussing a continent that is important with 50% of wheat is imported into the continent, depreciating national reserves and importing food that could be produced. I have not seen, and I have not heard a single youth forum, and I stand corrected if there is, discussing cassava, which is a climate resilient crop, that it produces up to 300 products that can be consumed by over 500 million across the continent. The discussion is only blame game and blame game. Am I trying to say that young people are not doing right? They're doing excellent, amazing work across the continent. But I think that the capitalization on success stories has been missing. We capitalize on our weaknesses. And let me just say this. When you capitalize on your weakness, you can never be able to make progress because the reality is that the world is a competitive space. And what matters is strength. What matters is value. If you do not bring value to the table to negotiate with your, from your position of strength, you lose. That's the reality. And just to add to what Dr. Emmy said, look, when you look at the discussion on gas in the continent today, on fossil fuels, there is a hidden narrative that at least let us be clear. I brought this up and I'll repeat it again. To build those one Liquid natural plant costs 25 billion US dollars. How many countries can afford that? Already, countries in the continent today 
are having a debt ratio of 77% to GDP, debt to GDP ratio of 77%. You will take a loan to increase that debt, and who's going to pay for it? And how many people are going to benefit as a result of exploiting fossil fuel? I said 84% of the entire African continent is in rural areas. You cannot reach them through grid because data shows that a developed grid per person in a Open area cost $500, but in real area cost $2,300. So you're talking over 360%. These realities are not communicated. And therefore, the profound power of a narrative needs an urgency of now by us to start debunking these myths, which sometimes mislead policy making and at the same time also make our young people to think that things can be done differently, even when we do not recognize the reality in which we are in today. And just one last point. We need a reimagination. A reimagination because I'm saying this because uh, Albert Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live all its life thinking it can never be able to climb a tree. That is what we are given some time to think that we cannot do it. But when we have solutions in front of our eyes every day. Who told us not to go to YouTube to learn how to turn agricultural waste into briquettes? Well, we use social media, which is a blessing in disguise to communicate falsehood. To blame one another. And so why I'm bringing up these things is that we cannot be able to talk about just transition and transformational development under the changing climate without talking about soft aspect, which is an urgency to change mindsets and to start telling our young people there are lies and falsehood, sometimes on issues that will never work. But what can work is forgotten and is not discussed, but which is what is needed. Over. Thank you, Dr. Richard. I think that's such a great point that, you know, you'll never have enough money to do it, but if you don't get started, you'll never actually do it. Uh, Dr. Arthur. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mao and uh, Richard. Uh, very, very exciting and empowering. But uh, I think the, the bottom line is I think time is now for Africa to look from within and from without, you see, some of these uh, and at certain times have presented us opportunities. For example, uh, COVID has showed us that globalization is not, it doesn't work. And you know, COVID also brought about the vaccine nationalism. Countries became selfish, they hold it. The continent was neglected, but, good, uh, but we survived. And, uh, and so, and we survived by looking within ourselves. In Uganda, we discovered uh, COVID X. I think Mao, you know that. We discovered COVID X and uh, we exported it in the region quietly. We couldn't call it a chua because then the World Health Organization would come in for uh, hard on us. We said it's a, it, it was a, just to, uh, like a, to, for hard immunity, but actually it, it was medicine. So I think the point is that the continent actually uh, faced with these challenges, we could look from within and get solutions. It is time to look from within and get solutions. We have always existed without the outside world. We could also give out. Now, in the case of refugees, uh, 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 refugees and climate change in, in Uganda, especially in West Nile, uh, Uganda has one of the best uh, uh, refugee policies. And actually, I teach uh, more say don. I teach one of the subjects I teach is the refugees and the displaced persons. Uh, Uganda hosts about 1.4 refugees actually in. The, in, in West Nile alone, but we host many, many other refugees. And these refugees in West Nile come from South Sudan. Although we host uh, uh, Rand, uh, Randis, uh, the Burundians, the Diara Congo, in other parts of the country. But we have a good policy. But the consequence of the generosity and the good uh, refugee policy has been depletion uh, uh, of natural resources, uh, uh, especially the forest cover in West Nile has been completely depleted, but also has increased the competition by the host community, between host communities and refugees, and completely uh, uh, the, the, the natural resources have collapsed, uh, almost collapsed. Uh, what we've been doing uh, in our case, uh, we've been working with West Nile, we, we work with the, the districts in West Nile, local governments, and other civil society organizations, we brought them together uh, to build resiliency and adaptation to climate change. And, uh, and, and it is, uh, we formed something called WENDA, I miss you'll find out. And Moses Ali, who is the third, I think second deputy prime minister is part of it, uh, to respond uh, to climate change uh, issues, uh, 
diversification to clean, uh, uh, to clean energy, but also to interest uh, the, the, the international community because uh, uh, the, the, the refugees have, uh, there is an international law uh, under, under uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, article, uh, article 51 of the, Gen the Geneva Convention, of course, uh, enjoins the entire, uh, the entire international community support refugees. So what we've been doing is to attract the support uh, 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 for the refugees and to try to, to, to recover uh, plant, uh, uh, plant uh, tree planting, massive tree planting, uh, diversify to clean energy, but it is a, it is a challenge. Uh, but what the hope, the hope that I have is that you see the international community, especially the regional, they don't want Africans to go uh, to their countries. And so they are happy to support them from, uh, from here. Uh, but also uh, what I actually see that is not forthcoming is the, the Africans themselves, like within the framework of regional, East African regional, uh, regional integration to come and, and support their own brothers uh, coming from Congo, from South Sudan. Uh, that is not forthcoming. So moving forward, I think it is important uh, 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 to interest the, the regional countries within the framework of East African community and within the African Union to, 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 to begin to support each other to deal with the, first of all, deal with the, with the question of refugee generation. South Sudan must be stabilized uh, because uh, of the, that's the governance failure but then also respond to the climate change issues collectively. There is a need for collective action uh, 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 by African countries within the framework of the African Union to respond to climate change uh, issue. And I think for me, I wouldn't want to look uh, 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 at Paris Agreement. And Africans have resources, but we have lacked leadership. We have to, there's a need for leadership in Africa uh, to say that we can, because you see most of them are not paying even their, uh, if you look at the East African community, countries are not paying Burundi, South Sudan. It's not that they are poor, it's a culture. So we need to also yeah. nurture leadership, uh, motivate leadership to try to address African issues. And then uh, uh, we can stand then uh, uh, our shoulder high that Africa uh, is. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Atha. And I think those are really, really encouraging words that the resources are here, the intellect is here, and the ability is here. It's just that lack of leadership. And um, I think for us, for us to stop looking outward and start looking inward, you know, so even for the young people who are on this call that, you know, you're not waiting for some future point in time to stand up, but now is the time for us to rise and make a difference. Um, I just have five minutes before I, I, I will call on people to just wrap up for us. Um, so very quick response to the question here. Um, and I'll put this one to Dr. Arthur. There's a question from an anonymous around the extent to which rent seeking and corruption by the political elite um, can impede the achievement of just transition and how do we mitigate that? Um, Dr. Amos, to you, I think just to ask, you know, um, COP27 is coming up in Egypt at the end of the year. What are some of the objectives that we are looking to um, for that? Um, and then to you, Dr. Richard, you know, um, how will the outcomes of COP27, um, COP27 um, be affected by the current oil crisis? You know, so if you could each just give me a quick one-liner um, and so we can still try to wrap up in time. Uh, Dr. Arthur, I'll start with you and then over to Dr. Amos and then we'll wrap it up with Dr. Richard. Yeah, certainly rent, uh, rent seeking, uh, corruption is a, is a cancer, is an answer that Africans must deal with. My country ranks high on the, on the corruption transparency index. And I think uh, 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 we need to deal decisively with corruption. And that's, of course, a governance issue. Uh, uh, that's what I was, uh, even actually, you know, we see uh, corruption in terms of political leadership. When I, what I talked about, if you, can, if you can allow your constituents to attack a forest, to attack a river so that, uh, and destroy it so that they are erected, that is corruption. You're already elected on the what? On the base on corruption uh, uh, tendency. So I think uh, that can be a problem. So what I say in the case of Uganda that I understand where we have an enabling legal system, the policy, legal and institutional system, what has been happening, we have not made them work. And I think time is now uh, a civil society 
civil society need to do to to to, to play a leading role. We have seen what uh, people, uh, civil society can do when you build. And I think moving forward, we need to build citizens' agency uh, through the awakening of civil society to cause some serious change, as we have seen in Sri Lanka. The corrupt prime uh, president has left. A corrupt prime minister is on the verge of leaving. That is people power. I think. Uh, people can express that anger. I think we need to create a critical mass about the need for a just transition because we have to escape. That's a, the, the opportunity that we have to escape because even the corrupt with that. So I think we need to, to, to build strong civic competence in the population and then, uh, and then fight corruption. It is the people who can fight corruption. Those in power benefit from it, so, but yet we collectively fail. So I think for me, I'm talking about citizens' agency. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amos. I mean, just my one liner is that I think uh, it's really important that uh, this COP27 meets Africa's agenda. And, um, and to think about the agenda that COP needs to meet, for me, as if you think about it, as an entrepreneur, as someone who is daily working on how to make this thing work, is that we do need to unlock the climate finance that Africa requires to be able to transition, because ultimately we are not responsible for this climate change. And most of these countries have made you know, through the Paris Climate Agreement and so on, that there's supposed to be 300 billion that's supposed to be unlocked, but have not been able to realize that, that goal. So if there's any one thing that uh, we, this COP needs to realize is really, re not only just reaffirming those commitments, but actually um, making sure that we can unlock the climate finance that is required to make a difference in people's lives. My biggest worry in terms of the current geopolitical alignment is that priorities do change. So there, many of these countries that have made those commitments are likely to, you know, turn back on them. And so now and I think that if, having said that COP27 should not lose the momentum that it has gained because all of these things are short term uh, challenges and so on, but we need to make sure that the outcomes really stick to Africa's needs and make a difference in people's lives. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amos. Uh, over to you, Dr. Richard. Well, I will, I will end up with this African proverb that there are no shortcuts to the top of the palm, palm tree. Yes, there are no shortcuts. The realities of Africans will be solved by Africans contextualizing solutions to the challenges we face as a continent. And those solutions should be climate action solutions so that at least we can build resilience to put more money in more pockets and food on the table. The second mm -hmm. is the narrative must be contextualized. The truth is that it's not the first COP that is held in the continent. In 2006, COP was held in Kenya here. In 2011, COP was held in South Africa in Durban. So this is not the first time COP in the continent. And because COP will come for two, three weeks in the continent, the problems of Africa will not be solved in three weeks. What does it mean? We must be able to take charge and become responsible because leadership is personal responsibility. If countries have already put in place their climate action plan, let's each and every one of us look into that and say, what can I, from an entrepreneurship perspective, start to do with what I have? And then use the data from that to then say to government, look, we need incentives here. We need tax break here. We need support here. Because the reality is externalizing solutions is the biggest risk to any system. And we have been externalizing solutions. And the last part, which I think I said it before, we must be able to shun away from these false narratives and start contextualizing narratives that build on what works and leverage what works in the continent and start believing in ourselves. If we do not do that, the changing climate will continuously expose the continent and actually derail development and plunge millions of people into suffering. That's something we should not allow because our youth are actually the solutions that we need today, but let's inspire them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. There's a comment here from Christopher saying a wonderful conversation. And I think really that's a really good summarization of this discussion. It has been a very good conversation. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more that can be unpacked that we could sit for an hour and just discuss 
just transition. We could sit for an hour and just discuss the various um, entrepreneurial opportunities that exist. We can sit and talk about um, the financial interventions. There's so many things that we can unpack that become offshoots from this discussion. Uh, but I think really just being here um, and having those conversations is set in the context of, you know, where are we in terms of geopolitics and just transition and giving everybody something to think about was really fantastic. So uh, to all of my panelists, Dr. Uh, Mayo Amos, to Dr. Richard Munang, um, and to Dr. Arthur, I'm going to try to this correctly, Baino Mutisha, which I hope I did. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and you sharing your insights with us and the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, as we wrap up, I'd like to welcome to our virtual stage, Dr. Uh, Sipo Hachigonta, who is the co-founder of AfriSench and Director of Strategic Partnerships at the National Research Foundation of South Africa, just to give us his closing remarks. exciting conversation. I enjoyed it so much. I, at some point, I thought like I'll just join in, in the conversation and, you know, <laughs> proceed with the discussion. Uh, sharing ideas, understanding practical solution opportunities is key, of course, as you know, to action in the just transition. And uh, uh, indeed, like all of us, we are aware that uh, the standard of living is getting harder uh, day by day. We don't have to look for it within our communities. And even if you look at, uh, especially if you look at the developing countries, our communities, our families, it's even becoming worse. And part of the solution, of course, is a just transition. It's access to clean energy, it's access to water and having a secure uh, space of food uh, and other challenges that, that we face. Let us continue this conversation. Uh, let us continue not only with, with sharing uh, challenges uh, and, and, understand, and understanding, but we also need to be part of, of, of the solution going forward. Uh, just to pull as one of the, 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 the many uh, comments from the panelists uh, that, that came up with, with regards to let's start making a difference and making a difference starts with me, it starts, uh, it starts with you. Let us all become ambassadors when we speak of the just transition. We, it, it shouldn't just be about words, it shouldn't just be about principles, it shouldn't just be about uh, these big ideas. Let's own it and let's make a difference within our different spheres of, of communities. Uh, on behalf of the African Center for a Green Economy, the IDRC, who have been gracious enough to support uh, AfriSeach uh, with, with, with this project on just transition, uh, the National Research Foundation, uh, as well as uh, the many other uh, partners uh, aligned to the just transition. I would like to thank you, the speakers. I think your insights were excellent. The energy was excellent. And just being frank, having that uh, Frank talk uh, to just discuss these issues. A special thanks as well to the, the participants. I think your active participation or the, the chats that were coming in, the comments, I think they were excellent. Many thanks to that. The team behind, thank you a lot for making this possible. And of course, the excellent facilitation, Siki, it was amazing. Thanks for your insights. Uh, and just your drive to guide the panel uh, with regards to this conversation. Uh, I would like to thank you all for participating and let's have a good day. And as I said, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Bye, Sipo, thank you very much. Um, thank you all so much, Sipo, for joining us. That is it on Geopolitics and Africa's Just Transition, hosted by um, the African Center for Green Economy. And I'd like each of you just to head over to uh, Facebook and follow African Center for Green Economy to Twitter at Afri, underscore, Afri Green underscore and on Instagram, Afri underscore CGE. Uh, let us keep the conversation going beyond here. Yeah. I mean, really just to say for every entrepreneur and organization that's been represented in the chat in this event, um, the work is small, the work is isolated, but the work is significant. And at some point um, it will culminate in greater results. And so please do continue doing your part to change the world and to make a difference. I'm Zim Keith, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you. Uh, stay safe, stay warm. Um, and if you're South Africa, you know, let us pray for our power cuts, guys. <laughs> Keep on, we'll see each other again on another platform. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.